technology, to learn about politics, to learn about economics in a drinking water area, to learn about uh, public administration. Uh, and they'll not only learn about it, but they'll stick with them. And also what they produce by way of a report, they can release to the public. So they have a triple header. They have a little citizen training, they learn the empirical material, and they make a contribution to the society so people can use their materials or their reports. And that's an attitude that doesn't take fancy new facilities or great educational budgets, just takes the right kind of attitude. If you take a political science course here uh, on Congress, let's say you're studying Congress for the semester, how do you study Congress? You take an 800-page tome, which is, you know, it gets to be a little dry, and you maybe write a little paper, or listen to some lectures. Uh, or isn't it better to, to study Congress by studying the microcosm of your two senators? So you have a course called Culver 101, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and you study the senators. And by studying the senators in their full context, you study the Congress. So you read that 800-page tome, that's like for breakfast. You read it, you read it critically. But you're getting basic and fresh and new information by interviewing the staff and going over campaign finance records and lobbying and uh, 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 sending questionnaires out and, and, and in general building a 100, 200, 300 page report on your senators. So what do you do? You learn more about Congress. You learn how as a citizen you can influence Congress because you're interacting with an actual live wire type situation and you're producing a 200, 300 page report evaluating the senator which is valuable to citizen groups and labor groups and farm groups and, and libraries and anyone who wants them. It's very simple. Just takes a different attitude of what education is all about, which is the studying of real life problems from the empirical to the theoretical and back to the empirical and putting them in a value framework. Not that you're taught an ideology, but you're given an opportunity to apply your value systems to particular problems. You may come out differently than your, your classmate. You may come out the same. The key thing is not to go through this myth of objectivity uh, that you should not learn about value development, value applications in the social sciences or what have you, uh, but to integrate those in an uh, in uh, educational experience that gives you the desire to continue learning after you graduate, which is perhaps one of the greatest benefits you can get out, out of a formal education. Gives you the desire of being able to weave your on-campus experience in the classes and courses and labs with your off-campus experience, whether it's shopping in stores or interacting with the legal system uh, or watching TV or what have you. That kind of mutual nourishment means that you're getting a pertinent flow of knowledge back and forth uh, on a, on a daily, uh, daily basis. Now, the public interest research groups are designed to give students this kind of opportunity. In Oregon, there are over 80 faculty that give course credit for students working on their own public interest research group projects. For example, in Oregon, they did a survey of savings and loans discrimination against women. And then what they found out was incredible. Get a couple would come in for a mortgage. They both would be working. They would lay out what they would be earning in order to get a mortgage for the home that they want to buy. And the savings and loans uh, employee would say uh, to the woman, um, are you sterilized or do you use contraceptive methods? Because you have to reassure the savings and loans people that you're not going to uh, be pregnant and therefore leave the job and cut a hole out under the mortgage security in effect. Well, this got pretty nasty, obviously. And the students did a survey of it and publicized it. And it was one of the things that led to the ban on discrimination credit uh, in Oregon as well as the rest of the country. Other students investigated pharmacy prices. Same brand name drug, corner one in pharmacy one, and in corner three, three two, three blocks uh, down the street, it would be 50 to 100 percent more. So they put out the names of the pharmacies, and they put out the list. Your Iowa PERG is putting out comparative pricing lists on a number of products that relate to the kind of purchases that you, you make. Uh, all over the country, Massachusetts, they blocked the utility rate increase because the utility rate increase procedures were not proper. 
in uh, Vermont. They got through a, a comprehensive child dental, ca dental care law after they did a survey of rural children in Vermont found that 50% uh, of the children under 15 never seen a dentist. The, um, the work that they're doing, prison reform, uh, legislative analysis, environment, is, uh, is good, solid. It's getting the respect of even uh, begrudging respect to even their adversaries. And above all, gives students an opportunity to link their courses in with this kind of civic involvement. Uh, right now, the PIRGs around the country are engaged in a demonstration program with NASA to use a domestic satellite channel. Uh, the domestic satellite is going to revolutionize our communication systems if we can get AT&T off its back. Uh, it's technological abundance up there par excellence. And NASA wants to encourage citizen groups and perhaps farm groups and labor groups to begin learning how to have direct uh, communication with one another through the uh, satellite installation, which the taxpayer uh, built. These are just uh, a few. As you know, some of you know, the Iowa PIRG has been involved in a struggle over the state uh, park uh, nearby, been involved in a whole host of highway transportation, utility, uh, energy, environmental, consumer uh, matters. And if you want to get more information about what they're doing, I understand there are some materials that are available here, I suppose, after you, you, you leave or being distributed. If you want to get more information, you will see how much is done with so little, so little. Here is an active civic group now which students in Iowa support, and their total budget is, is less than what a uh, single uh, fifth echelon corporate executive earns in General Motors. It's less than $40,000 a year. And they've got uh, eight to ten full-time people and volunteers and others working around the state. And they're known at the legislative level. What they're trying to show you is not that they're creating a paradise here and, and over, overcoming all wrongs or injustices, but they are showing you how much can be done with so very little when there is the knowledge base and the determination and a lot of truth and justice for their particular causes, that they have the silent support of so many people here in Iowa when they go after the abuses that so many people recognize but don't have an opportunity to do uh, much uh, about. If you are uh, particularly interested in, uh, in a, a number of subject areas like food and energy, tax reform, mind you, from a distance, they may not look, they may look important, but they may not look very exciting. But the closer you get to them, the closer they begin churning your own sense of what should be and what should not be, and what's right, what isn't right, the more you'll see that this is a, uh, a flowering way of civic life that can inspire you, bring out the best in you, develop your own talents, and keep you at a high level of alert and commitment, pulling away from the, the other kinds of pressures that drive so many people to alienation, indifference, and devil-may-care uh, type, uh, type attitudes. I want to give you a little story about a 19-year-old student who dis he was so concerned about nuclear power in New York State that he quit the university at SUNY, uh, up uh, halfway between Albany and, uh, and New York. And he went down to, to, to Washington, and he uh, uh, led a national petition drive for solar energy and against nuclear power. And he did it in a very unique way. He would not only have people all over the country having these petitions signed, but he would, when he, we got the names, he broke them down by congressional district. And, and so that he would go up to Congress on the Hill, for example, and he'd walk in, and he's just about 5'3" and very unprepossessing. Uh, and he'd walk into a senator's uh, office and he'd say, I'd like to see Senator so-and-so on the nuclear energy issue. And they'd say, well, who, you are, who are you and who are you with? And he'd tell them. And the, the aide would say, well, I'm sorry, the senator is very busy, you know. Uh, would you just write him a letter? And he'd say, no, I, I have written him letters, but I want to see him personally. And by the way, he'd take out and say, uh, I've got 14,000 people in the state who agree with me. Here are their names and addresses. Well, the door is suddenly open, and, uh, and he, got his, he gets his interview. Uh, the lesson, of course, is that 
it isn't, it, lesson is, is that here's a situation where petitions can either have zero effect or much greater effect. And, you know, th this is building up a kind of base uh, on this issue around the country. But it depends on the strategy that goes with it. If you just have a petition and you don't break it down by congressional district, it doesn't mean as much. If you don't have someone full-time in Washington lobbying with this material broken down by congressional district, it means more, and so on. And so it's to look at the whole citizen uh, issue as one of never-ending elaboration and perfection, just like a scientist in a laboratory always searching for new knowledge or new techniques to develop uh, new, new knowledge. This, uh, this kind of, uh, of commitment by, by young people, of course, is not quantitatively great. It's not quantitatively great in any age group. Uh, but what is significant is what they have been able to do, given their own small numbers and their own uh, determination, as a kind of etching of what really can be done by a large, much larger number of people. And indeed, if, uh, if you would like to uh, get a little closer to these kinds of activities, if you would like to, uh, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, uh, participate in the passions of the times, and there's plenty of that, uh, around. You will have every opportunity to do so, whether you contact your local Iowa Perg uh, chapter, or if you'd like, you can write us, uh, and if you have uh, pencils, I will give you an address. You could write us and get the following information. One, a free copy of a citizen's action book, which gives you 25 or 30 uh, actual projects that you can engage in at the community level whether it deals with Blue Cross, hospitals, employment discrimination, supermarket shopping, property tax, utility, savings and loans, or what have you. Uh, secondly, ask for a list of addresses of citizen groups where you can get specialized information, such as on food day, uh, or uh, how to organize your own citizen or student group, or any other dozens of, of subject matter, communications and the like. And third, uh, ask for a, uh, a free copy of a newspaper called, that we put out, called Critical Mass, which deals with uh, a whole range of energy issues, uh, particularly nuclear power. Ask for those three, you'll get them in due time. And the address is uh, Public Citizen, P.O. Box 19404, 19404, Washington, D.C., and the zip is 200. Three six, if you still believe in it, two o o three six. I'd like to end with some uh, suggestions of civic innovations, in very brief form, to illustrate that one uh, who analyzes abuses has an obligation to try to suggest ways of overcoming them. <clears throat> there are many people upset about utility prices. We have proposed a concept which is now gaining greater and greater attention around the country. It's a consumer check off on your utility bill. Every time you get your utility bill, if these state laws are passed, the utility, whether it's a telephone, electric, or gas company, will have to put in the envelope a little slip of paper which says if you wish to join uh, the uh, statewide consumer action group, here are the conditions, et cetera, and you'll be able to be part of a group that has their own accountants, lawyers, organizers, writers, engineers, who will represent your particular complaints and represent your interests when the rates are pushed up or when there are power lines going through farm country or whether they're nuclear power plants or what have you. Your own group, one contributor, one vote, and you control it, participate it, in it, and you've got a linkage there. You have solved the communication problem of how do thousands of disgruntled consumers of utility services get together to form their own uh, economic and advocacy unit. Uh, Governor Brown of California has this as part of his package to the California State Legislature, and it's moving in a number of states, including here in Iowa, where it is about to be, if it hasn't already, been introduced. It doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. It's not another government agency. It's just a piggyback on the utility bill since you give the utilities a legal monopoly and almost guaranteed rate of return by law. Why not have the law give, make the utility uh, facilitate you as consumers organizing together?
That's an illustration of the rising spread of the consumer checkoff system to develop a powerful consumer uh, groups around the country who can begin to inject qualitative justice in the economic uh, process. The second uh, proposal is the, is the consumer cooperative one. The farmers, you know, in a very interesting way, you ought to pr appreciate this being in Iowa, but the major political and economic innovations in our country in the past hundred years have come from farm areas, from the populist progressive movements, for example. Whether it's the concept of the cooperative, the rural electric, the kinds of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, direct democracy uh, initiatives, like the initiative, referendum, recall, just a whole host of uh, innovations uh, that came out of the rural areas. Indeed, there's, uh, I think, much to be said uh, that these kinds of innovations will come more, more likely will come out of rural areas than they will out of urban areas because rural areas have a higher degree uh, of people who have control over their own property and who have a cohesiveness of interest, whereas in urban areas there's a tremendous uh, split and diversity of interest and people often are tenants. They really don't have control in the broader sense over their own property. You ask yourself as you look at the way property is owned in the United States, you have people who own property they don't control, like stocks or pension funds, or they control property they don't own, like a mortgaged house or car. But in the populist progressive period, you had people who owned and controlled property. And when they saw themselves threatened by the railroads and by the banks, they moved. And they moved to combine the, their property power with their voting power, and therefore could develop a cohesive political and economic reform package. And their principles are still very valid today. The breakup of massive corporate concentration of power, the development of countervailing economic institutions, and the different use of natural resources. The countervailing economic institutions should be such as consumer-owned businesses, such as collaborative efforts between small businesses to try to stem the Goliath tide, the almost omnivorous tide of fewer and fewer giant multinationals moving in everywhere. Here was a bank in Chicago that wanted to set up an ag fund, a mutual fund in land speculation. Now, if Iowa, and Nebraska, and Kansas, and Minnesota were dominated by agribusiness giants, there had never been any opposition to the Ag Fund. And we would have turned the land in this country into so many accounting entries flipping through computers on screens to be speculated just as futures are, or stocks. But there are still semblances of family farms in these areas. Although we're losing, I understand, uh, a couple thousand farms a week in the United States at the present time, going out of business. And they got, in effect, they formed a political force and reverberated back into Washington. And the senators held hearings and representatives denounced the Ag Fund and the bank in Illinois withdrew. Now, who did one of the first basic analysis of the Ag Fund? And who fed this information? Once it was pu put out publicly, to the farm groups and to the senators and representatives in Washington and to the media. It was a full-time researcher for Iowa Perg that did that work. And that's just an example of many of the kind of impact that you can have on your society because you can communicate together, you can get information, you can analyze it, and you can double track your educational experience and your civic training at the same time, each one helping the other. The education helping the civic and the civic helping the education. To achieve this, you've got to analyze the necessity to stand firm against corporate domination of our universities, whether their domination through the trustees or whether their domination through the grants or the contracts. Already in Minnesota and Iowa, because the student pergs have been slightly effective or successful in what they're doing, the chemical companies, and manufacturing companies are beginning to move in and try to cut off the funding source. Moving in on the trustees or telling the university, well, we won't help this solar energy project 
or we won't fund this consultantship unless you turn around against the student effort here. What are these students doing? They should stick to their books. Never mind to get involved in these activities. The campus is no place for this. The students should just focus and get an education. That patronizing, sickening symptom of prolonged adolescence that they want, you, they want to indenture you with. That's what you have to stand for and against. The right to engage in full citizenship efforts. You are not second-class citizens. You're old enough in time of war to be taken off to war. You now vote at 18. You are not second-class citizens. And yet there's this constant pressure to say to you, you can't do this with your own money. You can't develop research projects. You can't present testimony. You can't file lawsuits with your own money. Why not? Doesn't the Constitution enter your particular environment, or does it stop at the university wall? In many ways, the ACLU has shown it repeatedly. Students are stripped or not given the rights that other people are given. And you've got to be very alert to that, not only to help yourselves, but to provide a legacy to the students who come after you. Once in a while, it's good to read that ancient Athenian code of citizenship, which in effect paraphrased said that citizens should leave Athens better than they entered Athens. And you should leave a university better than you entered it for those who come after you. So that this priceless resource of colleges and university students and faculty can contribute to a better society instead of be simple minions for corporate and governmental pressures and demands. Contribute, be a central repository of understanding the problems of our society, of creating or developing solutions, and of combining the two, and of creating roles for you so that when you get out, you can go to work in the kind of work every day where you apply your own skill and your value system. And don't live a schizoid life which tells you, get along by going along, We'll tell you what to do. You just apply the skills to what you, we tell you what to do. And almost all of you who work in large organizations, business or government, will have that problem. You will see corruption, waste, defective products, or what have you, things you don't like. And you're going to have to make up your mind whether you're going to be a person who says, I just work here and follow orders, or I just get along by going along. Or whether you say, well, I bring my conscience and my values to my work, and I'm going to stand up for them. Otherwise, what's the meaning of individual rights? What's the meaning of conscience? If in your daily work, which takes up the bulk of your time, you can't apply it. And if you go through that torment, which is a step, if you just surrender and don't even engage the torment, it's worse. But if you go through that torment, should you stand against the forces arrayed against you. As the welder did in uncovering un inadequate wells in a nuclear plant in Virginia. As the quality control inspector in the Fisher body plant in, in St. Louis for GM did when he discovered inadequate uh, procedures which exposed passengers to carbon monoxide leakage on the highway. As the scientists did in the Food and Drug Administration dealing with a hazardous food additive. They stood up. They took the brick brats. They were right. And people were saved and helped all over the country because of their efforts. It's that kind of moral courage that is the rarest commodity in any society. And it's that kind of moral courage which you've got to develop and sustain by helping citizen groups develop so that you can go to them when you're in difficulties like this. So that if a company tries to fire a chemist because he found the company falsifying pesticide data to EPA, that chemist can go to a citizen group for help and support. I want to thank you for your patience, and we can have a discussion afterwards if you'd like. But I do hope that you remember this last point that I just made, in, way, in many ways the most important one. Bring your value systems to your work whether it's a profession or corporate or government. And always ask yourself, how are you going to develop the conditions that will permit you 
to say the truth and not to have to be courageous in order to say the truth because the environment around you is such that it encourages you to apply your conscience and what you think is right. Because if millions of people surrender that, that right, then we'll be dominated by a few large organizations and the organizational mentalities. But if millions of people say, no, if they see something wrong, they're going to do something about it, then you'll see a flowering of courage and humane values in a technological society that is not known for encouraging them. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I understand the acoustics are pretty good here, but uh, up in the back, they leave a little to be desired. I'll repeat the question if you can just stand up and, uh, or the comment, and then we can discuss it. We have, yes. Can we have the first comment or question? Yes. Yes. Congress has a, a bill pending for returnable containers. Is there any hope for it now? I don't think in this session. I think what's going to have to happen is a number of states, in addition to Oregon and Vermont, will have to pass these bills. And once it gets to probably 10 states or so, uh, it'll be more convenient and more pressure on Congress to do it nationwide. Yes. First here and then up there. Yes. Yes. Question. What, what is my view on the role government should play in banning uh, products from the marketplace? Uh, the, quest, the illustration, for example, saccharin, which is uh, a proposed ban uh, by the Food and Drug Administration. Well, first, mark, uh, products that uh, are harmful products that are used by people in such a way that can harm other people uh, should be banned. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if, if you have, uh, if you have uh, a car. So where it's a really deep addiction, like if the, if the law banned cigarettes, uh, it just wouldn't work. Uh, people are saying, why are they banning saccharin when they don't ban cigarettes, which are much worse? The answer is there's no law that authorizes the government to ban cigarettes. There is a law which authorizes the government to ban a cancerous food additive, which saccharin is now described as by the Food and Drug Administration. So where there's a deep addiction and it uh, basically defies any legal prescription, uh, it will only create matter, it might make matters worse. Drive it into black market and crime and bootlegging and all the rest of it. There has to be other ways, education, taxation, et cetera, to deal with things like uh, tobacco or, or alcohol. Where, uh, where the person is not aware when the person is consuming the product, that argues for prohibition. If, for example, we go in the supermarket and buy products and they've got artificial sweeteners in them and they're not labeled as artificial sweeteners, dangerous, this could give you cancer, et cetera, uh, or th where pregnant, uh, pregnant women would be taking these artificial sweeteners and they may, be, uh, they may be affecting the fetus, those are where people are involuntarily being exposed to it. And where that is widespread, that argues stronger for a ban assuming all the time that the product is hazardous. So there are different criteria. Now with saccharin, the first study linking saccharin to cancer in animals in 1949, there have been now over 10 uh, credible studies linking cancer and saccharin in animals. And Canada banned saccharin 
uh, about a day before we did, a couple weeks ago. Based on a Canadian test, which was considered kind of like the final, uh, the final one. Canada banned it, and Canada does not have the Delaney Clause. The Delaney Clause in the United States is an amendment to the Food and Drug Act, which says any food additive shown to cause cancer in humans or animals, banned, period. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. Canada doesn't have that law. It has one of the more conventional food safety laws, and that was enough. They didn't need the Delaney Clause to ban saccharin. Our Food and Drug Administration performed as if it was trying to sabotage the Delaney Clause. It's still led by Ford administration holdovers. And number one, they misled the press with this 800 bottles a day. You've got to drink 800 bottles of saccharin uh, uh, sweet drinks a day to get cancer. Uh, that's, that's one of the oldest distortions, and the media falls for it almost every time. When you're dealing with laboratory mice, with short lifespans compared to humans, with high metabolic and excre excretion rates, and, uh, and you're only dealing with 500 mice or 50 mice, you have to give them a larger dose in order to find out whether there's cancer in that kind of limited population and limited longevity. I mean, you can't deal with 100 million people. Uh, we don't experiment on human beings, fortunately, in this country. So you extrapolate. Extrapolated, you could get uh, bladder cancer as low as 8 or 1, 1 1.6, I think, cans a day of soft drinks. Uh, that is, there'll be a statistically significant increase in those kinds of cancers. Now, saccharin is not what is called a potent carcinogen. It is, not, it is, it is called a soft carcinogen. It is not a potent cancer causing, so far as they know now. It is a soft, a, a, a weaker cancer causing. It's not like, say, cigarette smoking. And since A, there is no study that shows it contributes to the control of obesity. Both animal and human studies show it increases their appetite because it depresses blood sugar. You get an increased appetite. The mice gained weight uh, more that took saccharin more than the mice that didn't take saccharin. So people are kidding themselves, and they think, you know, it keeps their weight down. They make it up. The second is not necessary for diabetics. The Canadian Diabetic Association came out for the ban, and some of the leading diabetologists in the country said basically it's a convenience. There's an old, you know, the old sugar is, uh, sugar is deadly for diabetics. The thing is calories. It's a control of calories and carbohydrates that the, the diabetics have to deal, deal with. And uh, the final thing is that if you've got a choice between an artificial sweetener that causes cancer and one that doesn't, ban the one that does and allow the one that doesn't stay on the market. Now, a no-calorie artificial sweetener is not on the market now. A low-calorie is, but not a no-calorie, like saccharin. But judging from what a number of companies have said in the last two weeks, there are a number of them on their way. And so there'll be a substitute. That's, uh, that's sort of the, the most complex case of all, the saccharin case. There are a lot of things that are much easier. We ban dangerous drugs, for example, that uh, may produce armless and legless children, like thalidomide. There's very little debate about that. Yes, there's a question up there. Yes. Well, check in with your Iowa PERG office, and they will give you a list of groups around the country. And if you send for that list of addresses of citizen groups, that will give you another, another idea. We'll have a few more questions here, but there's also a cash bar over at Sheeman Audit, uh, the Sheeman uh, building on the first floor, and Mr. Nader will be over there after this session, which will be about another 10 minutes, to informally discuss questions with anybody who's willing to come over. So people who are leaving, if they want to go over there, it's okay to start things over there. Yes. The question is, how much are we involved in the Carter administration's new proposals for energy? April 20th, they're coming out. 
from the White House. We have, uh, we have made our contributions in terms of our ideas and suggestions. They're very similar to what most uh, consumer and environmental groups have been saying, heavy emphasis on conservation, stop or phase out nuclear power, develop solar energy, and uh, stop, stop uh, indicating to people that we're running out of fossil fuels, because we're not. That doesn't mean we should waste them. It means that we should not let a false uh, prediction of how many years we have with oil and gas stampede us into nuclear power as an alternative. Now, I think that uh, Carter's instincts and his knowledge are very good on this. His statements repeatedly to the, up to the present day have been heavy conservation, uh, low priority nuclear power, and strong on uh, coal under pollution control and solar energy. The big obstacle is Schlesinger. Schlesinger is a dyed-in-the-wool pro-nuclear advocate. He has been, he is, and he will continue to be until he's fired by President Carter. I, I, in one of my conversations with President Carter, I said, what are you going to do if one of your cabinet members advocates policies that are contrary to your pre-election campaign pledges? He said to me, uh, I'm the one who's running this, this government, and if they persist in doing that, I'll discharge them. We're about to recommend the first candidate for discharge. <clears throat> Mr. Schlesinger went up to testify uh, uh, almost two weeks ago, and he made the statements on nuclear power, which were incredible. He not only... Uh, uh, said that nuclear power would be an expanding source of energy for the United States, but he said that the anti-nuclear drive against nuclear power has subsided. Now, anybody who knows anything about what's going on around the country knows that that is completely wrong. All you have to do is ask the bankers and the utility executives as to whether the op opposition to nuclear power has subsided. They, the utilities have canceled 120 nuclear plants or indefinitely postponed them, in part because of reduced consumer demand, but in part because it's too much of an opposition to cope with and too much expense to build the plants, and they can't get credit from the banks. So it isn't just public oppositions. The banks are backing away, and uh, without uh, large federal subsidies, they're not going to build any more of these nuclear plants. They had, they had one order this year. They expected to have 30 orders for nuclear plants in the United States. They had one order, probably just, just to make sure it wasn't a zero year, and just bring it in. So there you are. You've got a very, very uh, touchy problem between the coming secretary of the Energy Department. And let me tell you that he could very well be the tail that wags the dog. He's a very powerful uh, personality. So is Carter. But Carter and his position on nuclear power doesn't have a $100 billion industry behind him, and Schlesinger does. And it's not enough that they're going to stop the breeder reactor and they're going to stop plutonium recycle. They've got to go to the core of the problem, which is the operating plants, where there is over a 1,000 times more radioactive material in a, in a 1,000 megawatt operating nuclear plant than the fallout from Hiroshima. And nobody disagrees with that. The disagreement is, will an accident, earthquake, or sabotage rupture that containment or rupture the transportation vehicles on highways and rails carrying radioactive material and release the gases and other materials to the public, to the environment? The critics say it's going to happen. Every technology has had a major disaster. This is not going to be an exception. And you can wipe out a major city and contaminate an area half the size of Iowa. That's why some farmers in Wisconsin are so bitterly opposed to nuclear power. That's the, that's the basic issue. That the ones that are operating, not uh, just the ones that may be built in the future, so ones that are operating. You have a uh, population evacuation plans around nuclear plants. Most people aren't even told about it, because if they were told about it, they may ask some questions. Why do you have population evacuation plans? You have limited liability protected by federal law, these nuclear plants. If they're so safe, why do they have limited liability from lawsuits? No other industry has it. 
chemical explosives. They, they, are, they have all their assets at risk if they have an explosion, for example, but not the nuclear industry. They went to Congress and got limited liability. Then uh, we, we dug up an internal memo a couple years ago in the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It was a recommendation by a technical staff not to build a nuclear power 40 miles where a 40 mile radius had more than 2 million people and where like 20 mile radius had more than 400,000 people. Well, where, how, many, how many miles do you think that, uh, uh, that Dwayne Arnold plant is from Cedar Rapids? That's like 9 or 10 miles. And you see what the, what the latest the backtracking in the government is, is build the plants more in the rural areas, not near major cities. That's a nice differential treatment of human life. You know, as long as you protect the urban population to some degree, but the land, the rural areas, that's where the plants are going to be built. Well, it's not that pessimistic because nuclear power is going to be stopped, both economically and because of civic opposition. But uh, it's not going to be stopped just by prophesizing it. It's going to be stopped by doing what thousands of people around the country are doing, learning about it, organizing groups, and, and, and working against it. Here we're blessed with the greatest source of energy in the you know, solar energy, and we go about uh, uh, with, with the deadliest form of energy ever created. You know, two pounds of plutonium has a theoretical lung cancer dose impact on, uh, for a million, a billion lung cancers. I mean, this is a very potent carcinogen, probably about the most potent on Earth, certainly uh, right up there. And it's the stuff from which nuclear bombs are made. Uh, they, the st citizens stopped the nuclear plant was going to be built right over an earth earthquake fault in California. The government was ready to license it right by the Bodega Bay. They got one almost built. They just discovered an earthquake fault three miles away on the, off the beach in California. And they still they want more nuclear plants. It's our technological Vietnam right here at home. And uh, we're the peasants if we don't stop it. Yes. It's necessary, and it should be adopted. There are about three states left. Is that it? Three, need three more states. ERA amendment. It's amazing how you know you could almost be for uh, for sunshine, and uh, there'd be a there'd be some sort of lobby against it uh, in the, in this country. Yes. Uh, someone up back there. Is there any up back? Okay. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I, I know some, some, some of what attracted Schlesinger to Carter. I don't know uh, what, all of it. But he's known as a tough administrator, and Carter loves that kind of characteristic. And uh, he impressed Carter in his meetings with him in Plains. Uh, but whether some, you know, key people called Carter up and said, you know, this is the man, uh, I don't know. Yes. We're not. Uh, we, we did a book on mental health called The Madness Establishment, and, uh, and we haven't done anything except for that. Yes? Uh, uh, Carter on consumer issues, so far very good in what he said, and so far quite good in what he's done, but it's too early to tell the latter. He's, uh, He's come out strongly for a key, key number of, of uh, structural consumer bills, consumer protection agency, class, consumer class actions, uh, and I think he'll stay firm with those. But uh, it's still too early, you know, to judge. He's only been in office for two months. But it's a very refreshing change from Nixon Ford. You know, it's whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, he just had one. This is the one that bothers us, this milk uh, price increase. Apparently, Berglund gave uh, the milk producers a price increase even greater than they wanted or asked for. Let's put it that way, not greater than they wanted. It was 83% parity, and they were willing to go for 80 or something. Uh, it's going to cost consumers a billion more dollars a year. Now, the announcement is 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture stated today that it was going to increase the milk price supports by X. But suppose there was another announcement. Suppose they set it straight. Suppose they said the U.S. Department of Agriculture today announced an economic policy that would compel consumers in the United States to pay a billion dollars more for milk. There'd be a different public reaction, wouldn't there? Now, how is Carter and Berglund, how are they going to adjust the consumer's rights with the milk producer's rights? Uh, I'm afraid that uh, the decision they made, and Berglund admitted it in, uh, in a press conference yesterday, that it was partly made because Carter uh, gave a political pledge to the milk producers during the, before the election that he would increase their price supports. That's a hell of a way to make a decision, an economic decision. In fact, it's, uh, it's something that really should be challenged in court. You make that decision on the basis of economics. You don't make it on the basis of part basis that it was, a, you know, fulfilling a pledge, you know, I keep my promises type thing at the expense of, uh, of, of you know, the American consumer. Worldwide what? Efforts the Carter administration put into worldwide uh, population control? They haven't indicated anything yet on that. You mean worldwide? Well, there, there is a stream of aid from the U.S. to countries uh, sort of discreet and quiet under our aid programs. Uh, it doesn't amount to very much in dollars. And then there's the, uh, the citizen groups, zero population growth and so on. But by and large, our policy is that we'll provide uh, foreign countries with the information and the, and the technique, uh, but they have to make the decisions themselves because it's too explosive an issue. Yes? What about the influx of organized crime into big labor? Well, it's also going into big business. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all weaving together. Yeah, sure. The problem is that it's your definition of organized crime. See, I think a lot of what Exxon and, and GM does is very well organized crime. See, and uh, the, uh, you know, if they can fix prices and rip off people for billions of dollars, that not only is technically a crime under the antitrust laws, but it's very organized and very successful. Uh, what you're talking about is more the underworld, so-called. But now there's kind of more and more accommodation between overworld crime and underworld crime, and it links with political, uh, po political figures at the local state level, like New Jersey, uh, judges, uh, mayors. Uh, so it's all one link. And as it gets into richer and richer uh, veins, uh, you're going to have a, a difficult time distinguishing any of them. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the Teamsters uh, have had a lot of trouble in that manner, and the Teamsters are not alone. I mean, they, there are various uh, corporations that uh, play ball if they're not involved. And, and, I ha and, and no one has seen the uh, Carter administration uh, a very much of a determination to deal with, with that problem. But that problem, you know, overworld, and, I mean, the whole mix is, is just destroying the integrity of government, integrity of the law. And when you see Richard Nixon emerging for the first time after he went to San, San Clemente with, uh, with uh, Fitzsimmons and Provenzano on a golf course, uh, that's access, let me tell you. That's real access. Yes. Well, uh, one is to get consumer issues in forums that the mass media can't ignore, like congressional hearings and courts. Then they're more likely to report it. And the second is to develop an alternative mass media, whether through public television or cable or satellite, so that there, instead of just having three channels, you can have 30, 40, 50 channels to work through or work on. Uh, and then the other kind of mass media would be this consumer checkoff situation. That's a kind of mass media. That 
connects up millions of consumers to pool their resources for common, uh, common endeavors. And the checkoff can, can operate on television itself. Imagine if one minute every uh, day, prime time, was given over to the television viewers uh, uh, group in the United States with local chapters. And every, every day they had a minute given to them, a prime time or two minutes, where they could uh, inform the public, tell them where they can get in, uh, studies of TV violence or programming, tell them what their rights are, uh, give them a schedule of events that uh, what they're doing around the country to improve television or, or widen the access to the public, see? So that's, those are, that's where you piggyback the mass media as a matter of right uh, from the point of view of consumers. Yes? You, uh, I heard only snatches of it. Social Security, what? Oh, you mean uh, broadening benefits? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the Social Security system is not, a pri is not like a private insurance system. It's a pay-as-you-go. And one of these days, the public will say, we don't want to pay 15 or 20 percent on the payroll for Social Security, and uh, then the benefits will start getting cut back. That's what's going to happen. Right now, uh, as the projection of demand on the Social Security system increased, the, you know, the percentage has been going up, as, as most people realize, contributions by the employee and the employer. Uh, but there will be a point where, you know, that violin string will twang, and, uh, and they'll start cutting back. But the premonitions of bankruptcy are, uh, are, are, are simply, they can't, you can't judge it the way you do a private insurance for a company because it, there's an there's a, a almost a, a substantial ability to keep getting more into the system before uh, the, the resistance gels. Yes? Well, the question is, what, <laughs> what made me decide to go on a Saturday night show? I have amnesia on that. <laughs> How many people saw that? Well, maybe that's one of the reasons. I'll tell you, I, I went on for, for bit, I think, three reasons. One is it was a, a way of getting a lot of information across, I thought, satirically, uh, that uh, to a very large audience. So 30 million people saw it. And, you know, we had a little skit on solar energy. And all the things I, I said to Ackroyd, who was acting out Carter, were things I told Carter. So it was, you know, it was like just repeating them to a larger audience, getting the points across on the cooperative bank, the consumer cooperative bank bill and other uh, bills that we uh, support. That was, that was the principal reason. Uh, the second reason was I figured if I went on, it would encourage that show to get other non-entertainers to go on, which would in turn encourage the script writers to hone uh, more effectively social satire. Because if you've got a non-entertainer on, you usually have to have uh, less flip and more social satire, although there's a mix, as you know. There's only so much you can get across there. And, uh, and uh, I think that's going to work. Uh, Julian Bond is going on in April. He's taking a plunge in, in April. I told him I wouldn't go on again until the President General Motors went on. <laughs> uh, the third reason was it was fun. You know, it was really enjoyable to see a whole you know, see how a, a show like that is put together. And uh, you learn a lot about a particular industry. I always, when I was in college, I would always, uh, summers, I'd always try to work a different job all the time, because it's very important. Because later on, you only do one or two things. But when you're young, you can, like I, I picked fruit in California and worked in a typewriter factory and worked in a restaurant and did a lot of things. And I've always uh, believed that whenever you get a chance to get access inside a particular uh, industry or, or artistic enterprise or what have you, you should take advantage of it. There are about 100 very nervous people putting that show out. And when that 11.30 comes, uh, it, it's a very, very tense situation for most of them. Because, and that's why live TV is so rare. And that's why live TV is seen by, or is, is, you know, li a lot of people like to see live TV. 
Let's see, I have a couple more and then we'll go to the next session. Thank you. When did this, uh, this was a chemical what? Yeah, it was, it was dumped where? Oh, put on the roads? Just vaguely, there's a little uh, paragraph on it in the Washington Post a few days ago. If what? Oh. The Des Moines Register played it down? Yeah, well, you see, a similar situation had the animal feed in uh, Michigan. PBB, uh, the fire retardant, got into animal feed, uh, fed to uh, thousands of, of farm animals, and uh, they died, and people have got it in their, in their bodies, and uh, getting all kinds of symptoms, uh, shaking and the like. Well, I, it won't be. You'll, it'll come back up again, I'm sure. Uh, these things tend to bounce back. Uh, the, the publicity on this PBB is getting bigger and bigger, and it's three years later. But you see, this is why you need, a, you need your own public interest uh, research group, you see, to go in and after that sort of material. In Michigan, where there are trucks carrying radioactive waste through uh, southern Michigan, nobody knew about it. So the Michigan Public Interest Research Group put out a very good report. It was, uh, Jack Anderson devoted a whole column to it in his 900 papers on the transportation of radioactive waste in Michigan. And that was the report that generated other studies around the country. You see what you can do with your own, uh, you've got the tools, you've got the equipment. You see, there are, there are two different categories of, of accomplishments uh, in terms of their obstacles. So what you want to do and you say, they won't let me do it, you know, whoever they are. It's in their hands. And there's other things you may want to do that are entirely in your hands. And the whole concept of your own research and action group is in your hands, very substantially. I mean, there'll be some opposition, uh, but if you, if you hold together, given your large numbers, very modest financial contributions, like a round, equivalent to a round of beer on Saturday night, once a year per student, uh, and you hold together and you got your own full-time lawyers and scientists and organizers and writers and lobbyists, they can't, uh, they can't tell you, you know, just go away. It's in your hands. I mean, if you say, I, would, I hope the arms race stops, well, right now, that's not in your hands. The idea is to make it in your hands, but it's in the hands of, you know, a few powerful political and other negotiators between major powers. But this is in your hands. Yes. Yeah. The question is, is solar energy so new, uh, why do we only see it in, you know, $100,000 homes or I have expensive uh, buildings? But the problem is just the reverse. Solar energy is too old. See, the world ran on solar energy until about 1850. It was called wood. <laughs> and, uh, and then along came coal and uh, oil and nuclear. And they were much better for the corporate structure to exploit because they are characterized by difficulty of access. You can't go out and dig your own coal mine. Exclusive possession and relatively finite. The companies preferred the kinds of energy that they could exclusively possess and control the supply. The sun is just...